the same way Adam did in the fact that Adam was created without sin and he was the first to do such a thing, right? He was the first human to do such a thing, to be without sin and to sin and thereby changing the nature of humanity. And so people would possibly say, I've even said it before in the past, golly, man, that's not fair. Look at why I got to be cursed for Adam. And I made the point that if God created a little garden for each and every one of us, the result would be the same. We can't think that because Adam fell, we, we would not have fallen. No, the reality is that had we been tested and tempted the same way Adam was, we would have. There was only one that would be tested and tempted that would not fail, and his right. name was Jesus. Amen? So, uh, but in the good, so the good news is, is that angels... The angels sinned differently in the sense that they weren't born all of one race already in sin. They were created at the same time. I mean, you can't really prove that, but that's the idea there. We, we can, because the Bible doesn't necessarily talk about the day the angels were created. But you can imagine that God created all the angelic beings in one shot. And whenever the ones that fell, fell, they all were perfect in nature. We get that from the idea that Satan himself was perfect in nature without sin until pride lifted up. And the ones that fell with him threw their lot in with him. There is no redemption for them. They each individually made a choice to go their own way and there is no redemption in them. But because of the fact that we're born in sin by the one man, Adam, we can be saved from sin by the one man, Jesus Christ. And that's really what much of this is talking about. So it's really a blessed thing that not saying in no shape, way, shape or form is sin a blessed thing. But it's a blessed thing that we, we were we sin because we're sinners and we were born the first time as sinners in Adam because now we can be saved altogether in Christ. Amen. All right. Next verse. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Next verse. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So the, the law essentially was telling us. It tells us the character of God and it tells us what God perceives as right versus wrong. And whenever you in, introduce the law into the situation, okay, because there was that period of time where there was no law. You had the, the garden incident and then the, the calling of Abraham and the formulation of the nation. And it's not till the exodus that the law actually enters into the human realm, right? And the, and the law of God entering into the human realm as he creates this nation, Israel, actually increases the level of sin. Why? Because now man knows the difference between right and wrong. He's got a clear delineation of what's right and wrong. And in addition to that, God's now keeping an account of it. But we all know that whenever somebody tells you, don't go put your hand in the cookie jar, the temptation is even greater to go put your hand in the cookie jar because the law doesn't give the power in order to not That's sin. Right. It just tells you what you're supposed to do. And you know, I don't know about you, but I used to be very, I, I don't think I'm as self-righteous as I used to be because I'm telling you, I was so bad that I would think to myself that, you know, if someone else smoked, but I dipped. Now, I would have never told you that, but I thought in my mind how I came up with that conclusion. I have no clue. But somehow I thought that I was more righteous than the other person that smoked because I dipped. Yeah. I don't even understand it. It just it's kind of it's like craziness. But, but so that's what I'm talking about, self-righteousness. So why are you even saying that? Because people can have a self-righteous spirit about them and they think that somebody else's sin is more gross or worse than theirs. And they look down on that person, but they're unwilling to look at what's in their own life. Hello? You got your own, well, I don't, it's kind of weird when you say it, but my old pastor used to say, you got your own booger in your biscuit. It's kind of gross. Booger in the biscuit. Yeah, man, it's some nasty stuff. Anyway. I'll try to make a habit of not saying that because I used to cringe every time I'd say it. But the point is, is that we got our own stuff going on, right? And so the point is, is that when the law entered in, when God placed the law in there, it had multiple purposes. But one thing that it did is almost like uh, throwing gasoline on an ember. It caused a flaring up of sin. But look. But where, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The idea that Kenneth Weiss, the Greek scholar, says is that it's almost like the sun. I've drawn a picture before. It's almost like the sun that shines on the earth, right? And the sun's energy 
is, is far greater than the size of the earth. So much of the energy from the sun is projected outward into space. It's not even utilized. In other words, there's not enough earth to utilize all the resources of the grace, sun. Grace, and, amen. There's not enough sin to over utilize the amount of grace that God gives through Jesus Christ. All right. So let's go to the next verse. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, next verse. So here we are. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Now the idea here, whenever we would teach this in the past, we would describe the fact that this isn't talking about acts of sin. This is whenever I would first introduce the sin nature um, because the idea here is that the sin is speaking of a noun and that it, it's, it, once again, it's talking about the sin nature, the factory of sin that produces it in our life, okay? And the idea is that we won't continue to have a relationship with the sinful nature. It's almost like sin is being personified as a person. And if you can imagine yourself sitting on the couch, flipping through the channels with sin, and you're just like having your relationship with him. It's because you have your relationship with him ongoing and active that you continue to engage in acts of sin. That's one of the things. I, I was a Christian for 12 years and didn't understand why it was that I couldn't get victory over various areas in my life, dipping being a main one. And it was, yes, there's a physical addiction connected to it, but there's a spiritual uh, addiction connected to it, demonic spirits. And because I didn't understand, I'm just over here through rules or willpower or self-control. Don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit will strengthen our self-control. But self-control in and of ourself isn't more powerful than the sinful nature. And if the sinful nature is still active and producing the impulses of sin in our life, then we have this desire that we might be able to overcome for a period of time. But the reality of it is, is that at some point in time, it overcomes us. All right. Uh, but but so Paul's saying, why are you continuing in this relationship with this sinful nature that because you're not supposed to really be in an active relationship with it? And he, and he goes on to say that. Know you not. And that's that word agnaeo where we came, where we got the name for the Bible study, which it has the idea of ignorance behind it. In other words, did it you did you not know is, is what Paul's saying? Hasn't anybody taken the time to, to explain this to you. And so I don't know about you, but I was a Christian for many years and I had not been explained this. But and to be fair to most of the preachers that I had sat under, it was mostly because they didn't know themselves. I'm not picking on them. They just didn't know uh, because most people don't study the Bible at this level, especially not. I hate to say it. It just is what it is in Pentecostal and charismatic circles. They don't study the Bible. They don't study the original language. They don't under, you know, understand the importance of it. But so did you not know, were you ignorant of what, Paul, of this? That as many of us as were baptized, not water baptism, right, but baptized by the Spirit into Jesus. So when you were first born again, the Holy Spirit put you in Christ. And when that happened, you were baptized into his death. In other words, there's that inner connection between you and Jesus, right? A unity, a unison, a, a, an inner connection. The scholars call it the vital union. You've become one with him. It is death. And, and, is, and, and therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. The old man born of Adam dies with Jesus, is buried with Jesus. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I said when we taught this that there's a death side of the cross. You can't, you don't want to stay dead, but there's a resurrection side of the cross. Just like Jesus resurrected, we resurrect in him. The same spirit that quickened him from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Amen. Not just in the resurrection. Yes, but also in this physical life that we live today. And it says uh, that, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together, there's that unity, vital union in the likeness of his death. If we died like him, we shall also be in the likeness of, res of his resurrection. We should live in him. Knowing this, that our old man, that old man, old Adam, born, of, uh, born the first time, is crucified with him. 
that the body, this sinful nature that we were plagued with in our first birth of Adam might be destroyed. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. Now, it's important that we understand destruction has the idea. I mean, you get a picture of a building, you know, exploding and debris flying everywhere and there's nothing left. The sinful nature is not really like that. Okay, the sinful nature, you don't eradicate it when you get saved. In other words, it's more like a relationship. You could consider it kind of like a divorce. Uh, I think there was a song. There was a song I used to like, but, but I can't remember. Anyway, like a relationship that you used to be involved in. And I, I got this analogy from Lauren, but it worked for me because it was true for me also. That you got an old girlfriend that you used to see. I, I, don't, I dated this girl for like five years. And as far as I know, she's still alive. Cynthia kind of, I think, has talked to her a couple of times. I haven't talked to her in 30 years. I think she's still alive. Uh, I'm still alive, but the relationship's not alive. And so whenever you die in Christ, there's a severing or a change to the relationship between you and this sinful nature. You're no longer just sitting on the couch with him flipping through the channels. There's a divorce that's taken place. And that relationship is no longer active. It's, it's no longer alive, right? Now, it can come back alive. And that's really what Romans 7 is about. We're not going to get into Romans 7 this time around. But that relationship can come back alive. And I've said this before, but the way that relationship comes back alive, I use these two words right here, law or license. And the reason I call it license is because Paul says, what, do you think we got a license? The idea is, do we have a license to sin just because you're under grace? See, sometimes we just look at law, but the reality of it is, is that if we pretend in this place that there's not still things out there that entice our fleshly desires, then we're wrong. Right. And when we give in to those things that entice our fleshly desires, we now give permission to we give the devil a foothold. We now give permission for the sinful nature to regain life. It's almost like I'm saying, I'm revoking the divorce. You can come on back now. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, 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 I kind of miss you and I, I want to hang out with you again, right? And so that's what, what can take place. And the other thing is law. And what I mean by law is whenever you try to engage in a form of Christianity that's rules-oriented, self will is the source of energy or power behind it rather than the energy of the Holy Spirit, if you're okay with that word. I didn't make that up. The, uh, the, the Bible scholars use it because it comes from a Greek word we're going to talk about this morning. It's the energy or power of the Holy Spirit that's producing the victory on the inside of the believer. Amen. Amen. He's the power source, not you. Amen. Don't get me wrong. Once again, he will empower you to engage in self-control. But if you're trying through willpower to engage in self-control, sooner or later you're going to wear down and you're going to be defeated. All right. He says that henceforth we should not serve sin, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead, if indeed we're dead with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. So the idea that we pointed out there was is that, yes, it's true, he died for our individual acts of sin. But right here, once again, it's talking about the fact that he died to the source of sin, the power of sin. You know, I don't mean to get too technical, but this is how I think. It, it, a lot of this is based on legality. I like courtroom drama. I, I, I kind of wish I would have went to be a lawyer. I think I would have been thinking sometimes they crooked, but I think I could have been. I think I could have done it. You know what I'm saying? Like get up there and get in the argument type thing. Um, I really like that, man. I, I, I get into it. But uh, this whole thing about sin from God's perspective is a very, le a very legality oriented situation. What I mean is, is that Adam's submission to the serpent gave a certain right to the enemy to hold man under his dominion. Now, no, no payment was due the enemy. God was the offended party. 
Okay, but because of man's disobedience, it gave influence and power to Satan to hold man under his dominion and control. Where there is sin, there is death. There's the fear of death. Man has been held under the bondage of the fear of death, held under the bondage of sin. But that's the good news of Hebrews 2.14. Because the children, you and I, were partakers of flesh and blood, because we were made of this stuff, he became us. So that, why? So that he could die. That he could die the death of the cross, according to Philippians 2, in obedience to the Father, so that he would destroy the power that Satan had through death. Amen? And so there's a very legal aspect to this. In the mind of God, God's very a very critical thinker, if you would allow me to use such terms. God's, God's got this plan really worked out real well, and it works perfectly. And this is how he can demand justice and at the same time provide the gift to where you can't provide what it is that he wants other than simply trusting and surrendering right. to what it is that he's offered. Amen. All right. Uh, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but that in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we said the word reckon there is the same word in, in, in Romans 4 where it said that uh, righteousness was accounted to Abraham's account. Remember that? It was put in Abraham's account. And David said, blessed is the man to whom his sin is not imputed. Those two words in the English translated differently for whatever the reason. Same word in the Greek, logizomai means to do the math, come to the right conclusion, but also describe something being put in someone's account. So what we're saying here in Romans 6, 11, is that what God said there about us, based on Abraham's faith, God said, you're righteous. We are the children of faith. We are the offspring of Abraham. That's what Galatians 3 says. Why are we the offspring of Abraham? Because Abraham was the father of the faith. God gave promises to Abraham before the law ever came. This is scripture right here. Before the law ever came, God gave promises to Abraham that through him, through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Not seeds as of many as though it were the nation, but one seed, which is Christ Jesus. Because the blessing of Abraham is when you put faith in God's plan. Now righteousness, amen, is given to you as a gift. Now you become the child of God, the children of God, amen. He's the father of the faith. And, and so, um, lost my train of thought there. God says, righteous, put into your account. And now in Romans 6, 11, he's wanting you to believe what he already believes about you. Now, therefore, you reckon yourselves. You, you do the math. You come to the proper conclusion. You uh, do the accounting work. That you're dead in Christ. Amen? That you're dead in Christ. Dead, you, you'd be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Because you indeed are dead to sin, because your relationship with the sinful nature has now been severed, don't allow yourself, don't let sin be your king, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither should you yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Now we talked about the fact that members are body parts. It could be eyes, mouth, hands, feet. Now, we don't need, need to use our imagination too much, but my point is, is your body parts can, can be utilized very easily as instruments or weapons, really is what the idea is, weapons of warfare. It could be tools. The idea in the Greek is implement, implements or tools to you be utilized for building. So God uses people's body parts to build his kingdom, right? I mean, because he uses humanity to do that, but also as weapons of warfare. So whenever a person's living in the world or they're yielding their members to the forces of evil, they're allowing their body parts to be utilized as tools to build the kingdom of darkness or as weapons of warfare for the kingdom of darkness versus whenever they're yielding their members to righteousness, they're allowing their bodies to be utilized as tools to build the kingdom of God or to be as weapons to fight the forces of evil. 
We talked about the fact that the word yield means to give the right away to someone, right? I thought that was interesting. It is like the Lord just popped into my head. The difference between a stop sign and a yield sign. A stop sign is a command. You have no choice. A yield sign, there's a little bit of your own will involved. You have to make a judgment on that. You have to determine the distance. Do I have to, can I go or do I have to stay? That's kind of like our free will. God doesn't demand or command. Yes, he does in his word, but he gave you a free will to make the determination. You're either going to serve me or you're not. So he says, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness and the sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now in verse 14 is what we covered last week, 14 through 16, he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. We talked about the fact last week that that sin gives, that the law gives strength to sin. That was 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. And so law, it's literally like, you ever wondered why? Uh, you ever wondered why you wanted to get rid of something in your life? And you, and you said, I'm, man, I'm just going to pray more. I'm going to do this more. I'm gonna, and it didn't work. That's I'm right. going to fast this out. I'm going to pray this out. I'm going to go to church this out. I'm going to rebuke this out. And it didn't. I mean, yeah, okay. You, you say you got a little bit of a reprieve for 10 minutes. All right. But what I'm trying to say is, is that that don't mean freedom. It is because you're operating in a form of law. It's, it's self-performance. And it doesn't work. He says... Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under the law, but instead you're under grace. And where grace is, there's strength from God. Amen? Yeah. What then shall we sin because we are not under law? That's the license thing. Okay, so you're not under the law, so now you're just going to sin? He says, God forbid. Know you not, because this is why. Don't you know this? That to whom you yield yourselves to be their servant? Guess what? You become who you obey. His servants you become. Amen. If you're going to obey the works of the enemy, the, the enticements of the enemy, you're going to become his servant. It's not to say that you can't still come to the place where the Lord will give you victory in that area. But now you're taking another trip around the wilderness and it was unnecessary is what the word of God is saying. He says, uh, whether of sin unto death or, or, or of obedience unto righteousness. Amen. All right, let's look at, at Romans 6. 17 through 23. We're going to read this. And I think that my message this morning is kind of short. That's why I felt like it was okay to review all that. All right. Romans 6, starting in verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So that's kind of like where I felt like the passage that she read out of Isaiah 55 was uh, connected to what we were talking about this morning because the word doctrine literally talks about the instruction of God. Okay, it talks about the teaching of God, the word of God, and how it has an effect on the life of the believer. It says, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Now, Paul's basically just saying right there, Listen, I'm going I'm to use a human analogy because I, I don't know that your understanding of spiritual things, I mean, it's just what he's doing. He, he's saying, I don't think you can understand exactly what I'm trying to say, so I'm going to use a human analogy. And maybe it's not, the, you know, it doesn't work perfectly because he's talking about being a slave of, of sin and then talking about comparing that to being a slave of righteousness. Now, we've already discussed this last week because we talked about the fact that God. The, being a slave to God and being a slave to sin are two completely different things. The enemy will always hold you against your will. God will never hold you right. against your will. Amen? Amen. He's, not, he's not a hard taskmaster like that. He gave you a free will and he wants you to utilize it because he wants you to choose him. Amen? Amen. All right. So that's, what the, that's why he's saying that. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh. All right. He says, uh, for as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and holiness. So the idea is that man used to live for the devil in a big kind of way, right? I think of, 
I don't know. I think of sometimes like, you know, here's a, you can see a preacher on the pulp, on the platform speaking forth the word of God. And I just believe this is how I've always imagined it. I just believe that the word of God going forth has an effect on the atmosphere. What well, you know, if you, you could look at it like it has an effect on individual people's lives, whether it's your life, my life, we go out into the world that we live in. And then then it comes out of each mouth and it has an effect on the environment where you're placed. And then I think of because when I got into all that Illuminati stuff, I thought of this that because I was preaching in the jail one time and I was telling this dude because I was talking about the Illuminati and I was talking about the music industry, the hip hop industry. And I thought I, I, all of a sudden I said it and, I, and it was perfect. I felt like it was perfect. I was like, them dudes ain't nothing but preachers for the devil. They're standing on a stage with a huge crowd and everyone is hungry for their flesh to be fed. And the lyrics that they sing. I mean, people say, oh, I don't listen to the lyrics. I just listen to the beat. That's another proof that it's all about the flesh because the because the beat connects to the flesh. Mm -hmm. But but they listen to the lyrics. And if they're not listening to the lyrics is getting down on the inside of who they are. And the mute and, and what they're talking about is if it's not me getting over on someone mm -hmm. because I'm full of envy and jealousy, mm -hmm. then it's talking about sexuality or it's talking about violence or it's talking about getting high. It's talking about things that it's talking about really the words of Aleister Crowley, which was, I don't even remember what his words were. It's been so long. Do what thy wilt and let that be the whole of the law. Whatever it is that your flesh desires, whatever it is that you want to have fun today, because just live it up. Don't let anybody control you and tell you what it is that you can or you cannot do. Don't live under the system of, of, of rules and regulations. But basically what he was trying to do was he was trying to teach people to live outside of the will of God. And to transcend the will of God and in order to make their own flesh feel good. And so that was the, that's the yielding of our men. And so the point that I was trying to make is, is that whenever you were in the world and you yielded your members to the forces of unrighteousness, now those guys are doing it at an extreme level. And you have various levels of people living in the world and doing work for the devil from the guy that's on, you know, I don't know, that's in, that's in the school that's selling marijuana by the joint. Hey, I got, you know, whatever, or whatever they sell nowadays. Okay. Uh, to the guy that's selling it on a larger level, to to people that, you, you understand what I'm trying to get at. There's various levels, but whatever level it was, whenever people were truly in the world and under the dominion of sin, they were under the dominion of sin and they were doing works of unrighteousness and producing fruit for the kingdom of God. And the word of God saying, hey, the same way you did that, why don't you turn around now that you're a child of God and do that for the kingdom of God? Amen. Amen. Allow, yield your members to righteousness to produce the fruit of righteousness in the lives of people. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. A life of sin, right? I'm not saying that to be judgmental. I'm just trying to make a point. Whether it be a lustful life or a drinking life or whatever the case, they have no, how, how was the word? They have no, um, you are free from righteousness. When you're caught up in the midst of that sinful lifestyle, there's no desire whatsoever on the inside of you to be free from righteousness, to, 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 to produce righteousness. Instead, everything that's in you is desiring to fulfill the flesh. Even though it might leave you empty, even though it might leave you sad when it's all said and done, you think the next high, the next fix, the next whatever it is that you're getting fixed with is going to bring the fulfillment. And in reality, we know that it, that it leaves us empty. Okay? And so that's the point being. I can remember being, being in the world. And I mean, my heart was a little bit soft towards the Lord because my sister was a Christian and she had started telling me about things back whenever I was very young. But at the same time, I've talked to numerous people that have never heard anything about the Lord, had never had any kind of connection <laughs> to the Lord. And when you try to talk to them, they just think it's the most ridiculous thing that, you, that they've ever heard. Because, and they, they're free from producing righteousness. All right. But he says, um, he says in those Things where uh, what, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? The true child of God, when the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, there comes a day when you become ashamed of the things that you used to do. Sometimes I might tell you about things 
that I did in the past, but I can tell you that I'm not proud of the things that I did in the past. And that, and that they, can be, they can be very shameful. And each and every one of us in this room, I'm certain, have things that we could look back on that we would be shameful of. The problem with the world is they want to hold you under their bondage. They want to hold you under their thumb. And if they know some of the shameful things that you've done in the past, they don't ever want to forget it. They'll never admit what it was that they had in their own life, but they want to hold you under their thumb. Mm -hmm. You can see the self-righteous, and if you've been around the self-righteous, that's what they do. Right. And they'll talk about, and, and look, and, and, and then the sinner, too. He's still knee-deep in the sin. He won't talk about what everybody else is doing. You just don't get it. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on you, but you just don't get it. Jesus died to set us all free from our sin. Here we go back to the thing where, as silly as it sounds, dipping versus smoking. You know, you, you, trust me, you can look at what someone else has done. And don't get me wrong, there's things in our legal system that seem more heinous than others. But nevertheless, sin is sin and Jesus died for it all. And anyone can be forgiven. You might not like the fact that Jeffrey Dahmer could, can be, I'm not saying he was, can be forgiven. I know this is weird, but this is supposed to be PG-13. Killed pe homosexual murderer and ate people. Ate them. He can still, if he gives his life to Jesus, be saved. I had people talk, fussing about that back in 10 years ago. Sorry, dude. You don't have to like it. That's what Jesus died for. You don't even know what Jeffrey Dahmer had to go through as a kid. What caused him to become that? Started off with killing cats and dogs. I know a lot of kids that used to kill cats and dogs. Don't let your kids kill cats and dogs. That's a problem. Okay? Anyway, that's another story. Why am I even saying that? I don't know. But you are, you're ashamed of the things that you used to do. For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become service to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. We're going to look at Romans 6, 17 through 23. This is... Uh, Point, I'm sorry, Romans 6, verse 17 is point number one. And point number one, I couldn't, this is the best title I came up with for point number one, the processor rebooted. Your processor's been rebooted. Amen? Amen. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. In the English language, what I wanted you to see from this particular scripture is that it's more, see how it says that form of doctrine which was delivered you? It sounds like, you know, we're just sitting in a classroom and somebody's instructing us. But in the original language, it's deeper than that. It's something's happened to the heart. You obey from the heart. The idea is that it's issuing out of your heart. The obedience that you're giving to the doctrine is issuing out of your heart because there's a heart change, if that makes sense. And not only that, but it, the idea isn't that it was being delivered to you, but that you were delivered into it. So there's an interconnection between the heart change and the doctrine to where you've become one with them. Just like you became one with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. When you became born again, hallelujah, God delivered you into a new sphere. I'm not going to do it. I used to walk outside the door, but I'll probably not walk it. But, you know, this, the old sphere, when I say sphere, that's just like a kind of like a circular area, right? But I look at it almost like an atmosphere. You've been delivered into a new sphere, a new place. And in this place, I used to say there's grace, right? Y'all have heard me say that before. In this new place, there's grace. But in this new place, there's also a love for the pure doctrine of God's word. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's important that we understand that. Look, God did that in you. The idea is that in salvation, the nature change that takes place inwardly results in new desires. That's right. Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The word will there describes desires. In the new life, in the new birth, God does a work on the inside of you that gives you new desires. My old desires weren't the same thing as my new desires. 
Amen? Amen? Trust me, it's changed a lot. It needs some more changing, but I can tell you it has changed a lot. Sometimes when I look backwards, I'm like, D I cannot. I was a I was a really different person. And I know that that's the story for each and every one of us in here. Amen? Um, but so the uh, two words right there that started with a W, worketh and will. The will is the desires, but it's God that worketh in you. And this is that word I was telling you all about earlier. It's energia, energeo. Where we get our word energy from. All right. Sorry. Inner geo. Where we get our word energy. The energy of God. The power of God. The idea it has it, the word has the idea of effectual. In other words, it produces an effect on something. The word in old King James language was used wrought, W-R-O-U-G-H-T. And I've shared this analogy with y'all before to imagine a hot piece of iron that's just straight. And then under the hammer of the craftsman, it's twisted and pounded. And now it's circular and ornamental. It was wrought. His source of power on this wrought something. It affected it. It changed it. That's what's happening. It's God that worketh in you. The energy of God, the power of God, and the Holy Spirit is changing the desires of your heart. And also, through that, to do His will. Amen? Amen? We don't have to turn there for sake of time, but in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we've shared those scriptures recently about the new covenant, right? I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to put my spirit. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put my spirit in you and I'm going to cause you to walk according to my statutes and judgment. A new desire as the presence of the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you that's producing a desire for the things of God and the word of God. Jeremiah 31, 31. In the new covenant, covenant I'm going to put my word in their hearts. I'm going to write it like tablets on their hearts. There becomes a new love for the word of God. Amen. Okay. You know, we, once again, we talk about the fleshly desires of the world, but also there's a fleshly desire of religion. What I'm trying to say is, is that unfortunately in the modern church, there is this, there's a big mood. Listen, if you think that there is not a draw for people to go down the road to a church that's filled with people, listen, let's just be real. There is an energy in and of itself when you walk into a sanctuary and they got 150 people in there. It's like whenever I used to turn on Joel Osteen before I knew any better and they had 20,000 people in that stadium, how are you going to argue with somebody that, that God's not behind that when we don't realize that Satan is the God of this world yes. and that he gives blessings to people? The point that I'm trying to make is, is that I was convinced that that was of the Lord. And now I know that it's not. I'm not trying to say that the same thing is exactly going on down there. That's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to say is we have a fleshly enticement to say, hey, this must be of the Lord, but not necessarily receiving the pure doctrine of God's instruction. But even if you stood up in the midst of that crowd who might not be hearing the pure doctrine of God's instruction, if it was delivered to them under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and they truly are Believers of God, there would be something on the inside of their spirit, man, that would resonate with the word of God that was going forth that would say, that is of the Lord. And for that moment in time, they would be so hungry and have a desire to obey from the heart, out of the heart, that doctrine that they had been delivered into. But the mastermind Satan and all of his little minions and all of the work that's done through men stand behind pulpits. And like it says in the book of Ephesians, they throw the cubia, the dice, the sleight of hand with doctrines of devils and cause deception and produce in people this idea that big crowds is definitely of the Lord. Social programs where mama and children have a place to go. Hey, look, people want something for their kids. They just do. And right now, you know, we, and we need to always do better. OK, that's so. So that's just reality. I'm not trying to take away from that. And there's nothing wrong with us coming together as small groups if we're in, increasing the faith of one another and we're amen. staying true to the doctrine, the pure doctrine of the word. Amen. But when we move away from the pure doctrine of the word and we put that to the side and now what we do is we become a mental health dispensary and we're just providing a different kind of medicine. Mm 
is really all we're doing. And it's not the medicine of Jesus. It's the medicine of the world. It's worldly tactics that are packaged under a Christian code name. Preach it. And, and it's not then it's not the way that God would have it to be done. You, you have obeyed out of the heart change to that doctrine that you were delivered into. Amen. That was point number one. Your, your processor was rebooted. Point number two is that we were liberated to liberate others. Amen. <laughs> Being then made free from sin. This is verse 18, verses 18, Romans 6, 18 through 21. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You were made free from sin and you became the servants of righteousness. The idea of saying I'm talking about being liberated to liberate others because when you were liberated from the bondage of sin, now true works of God. And one of the things I was going to say in the previous point about that church situation is that we can come together and we can have social gatherings and we can, you know, fellowship with one another. But if we're not really installed into the pure doctrine of God's word, then it doesn't really affect our life Monday through Saturday. Whenever it affects our life Monday through Saturday, what happens is, is that the true child of God allows the word of God to be in him, but also come out of him. It's just a natural outflow. The love of God reaches out of us into other people. That's the way that it's supposed to be. You try to say that to these large crowds of people that preach a seeker sensitive message, it makes everybody cringe in their seat. It doesn't make y'all cringe because we talk about it all the time. Even if we don't all, including the preacher, always hit it the way that we should as far as for being the witness that we should, we all know that that's the truth and that that's what we're supposed to be doing. I'm telling you, I have been in congregations where there's 100, 150, 200 people and a message about personal evangelism is preached. The preacher is apologizing for it the whole time and you could feel in the atmosphere this uneasiness because people don't want to be challenged to say that they have to share their faith. That's not right. If we weren't supposed to share our faith, you and I wouldn't even be here today because somebody wouldn't have told you about Jesus. Amen. All right. You've been liberated to liberate others. You were set free from bondage and placed into liberty. We talked last week about the bond slave thing. Remember out of Deuteronomy, the whole earring in the ear thing? Paul said, I'm a bond slave of Christ Jesus. The difference between the, bond, the slave of the Lord... And the slave of the enemy, once again, sin will hold you against your will. God will never hold you against your will. The reason you desire to serve him is because the love that's been poured on you has caused you to fall in love with him. And listen, when you're in love with somebody, you want to talk about them. Yes. Come on. Even look, you, I'm just telling you, it just flows out of your mouth. Right. And so that's what's happening here. But also, let me say this. When I thought about liberating people, I thought about Harriet Tubman. Y'all ever heard of her? She was an African-American lady that was a slave. And she was a slave in Maryland. And dude, she like, what happened was, was that she got tired of being a slave. And her master died. And when her master died, she said, I'm heading, for the, I'm heading north. And, and she was a sick, kind of a sickly older woman. Her two brothers were started the journey with her, but then they heard in this, it was called the Democrat Gazette, I believe, or something like that, some Democrat newspaper that said, that, that said, uh, Ar Araminta, I think was her name, Harriet, <clears throat> that there was a reward for her. Her two brothers were like, dude, we're going back to the plantation. And so she followed them back to make sure they were okay. And then she said, but I ain't going back to slavery. I'm going north. And she, there, there was, they called it the Underground Railroad. It was this uh, connection of safe houses where they could hide. She made it to Philadelphia. So there she is. She said, when I walked in, when I crossed the border, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person because it was almost like the sun shining through the trees was like gold. It was everything looked different. I was a free person. But the thing is, is that whenever she was, once she was there, she said, I can't stay here. I got to help other people. 
So she started going back through the network of safe houses and she started bringing people back through that network, that underground railroad to liberate. She was liberated so that she could liberate other people. Amen. She helped 60 people that weren't even her family. Plus, she helped, uh, you know, bring all of her family back to freedom. So whenever, sooner or later, we're going to see Harriet Tubman on the 20. And I can tell you that that was a woman. Listen, it is what it is. That was a woman that had... She had perseverance. They called her Moses because because she was bringing the children uh, to the promised land. But you see, it's a physical idea that I'm trying to use to illustrate a spiritual idea that we were liberated. We were servants of sin, but we've been liberated. And now, amen, uh, we have been liberated to see others liberated. Now, because of those righteous acts that we engage in, when we engage in righteous acts, other people hear and see the good news of the gospel, and it puts a uh, puts a, a deal in their puts a, the idea in their heart and mind that there's something else that God can offer them. Amen. Being part of righteous acts that liberate others from spiritual bondage results in an eternal reward. I gotta hurry up with this because I don't want to linger it over till next week. I just put right here: this fruit will last. An eternal reward. Verses 22 through 23. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, we have your we have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we've been given a gift of righteousness that's going to result in eternal life. But not only that, I wanted to talk about the fruit of holiness because it's going our the fruit of holiness is also going to have an eternal reward. You personally have a, an eternal reward, eternal life. But the works that you do today, amen, on this earth, hold on a second. The, let me get the works that you do today in this life also can have an eternal reward. I remember when I was in the oil field, I was in Venezuela and I was jogging down the sidewalk. I was trying to lose some weight, got out there. Plus, you know, it's a good way to kind of see an area you've never seen before. And I was kind of sidestepping rotten fruit that was all over the sidewalk. I think I've shared this story before. There were so many fruit trees over there that the, the, nobody would even keep up with it. It was just public land and fruit trees just grew everywhere and the fruit would just grow on the tree, it would ripen, it would fall off, and it would it would just sit there and rot on the sidewalk. And so I'm over there sidestepping fruit. But you know, the good news is, is that unlike that fruit that was rotting and decaying on the sidewalk right there, the fruit that we produce for the kingdom of God, it's never going to decay. It's never going to rot. It results, amen, in an eternal reward. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 4 through 10, and then we're going to close with that. The Apostle Paul says, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan. He's talking about this physical body, right, that we're living in. We groan being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. So he's talking about the tabernacle that we're in being our physical body, this unglorified body. And then he describes it also as a garment of clothing. And he's saying, you know, it's not really the burden and the groaning isn't that we just want to be unclothed. No, but we want to receive our new clothes. We, we want to receive our glorified body because that same change that happened on the inside of you that delivered you over into good doctrine also put a hunger and a thirst in your heart to be with the Lord. I'm sorry if you're truly a child of God and you got a revelation of it. There, there's a part to you that wants to be with the Lord. Because everything starts looking like rotten fruit after a while. Right. All right. Now, he's going to bring some balance to it, but just hang tight. He says, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. I'm trying to get rid of this mortal life and, and, and tap into immortality. Not the wrong way, though, right? Now, he that has wrought us for the self-same thing is God. He's preparing us for that eternal life. Who has also, but until then, look at this, has also given us the earnest of the spirit. Y'all know what that earnest means? It's a down payment. It, it says it in, in, also I believe it's in Philippians, right? I think it's Philippians. The earnest of the spirit. 
Or it's Ephesians. Ephesians 2. Mm -hmm. The earnest of the Spirit is a down payment. It shows you. When you got saved, you knew you were saved because the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart. Amen? Amen. He gave us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst, that's a fancy way to say, while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, even though we're in this mortal body, walking around on this fallen earth, the earnest of the Spirit reminds us and tells us that there's a future for us to behold, that one day we will be absent from this body, and when that happens, we're going to be present with the Lord. Yeah, he says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul, look, Paul said it. I, to be perfectly honest with you folks, I would rather be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. You can judge me if you want. I mean, hey, it, I don't blame him. If I was getting beat up as much as he did for preaching the gospel, I'd be Lord and imprisoned as much as he was. Oh, Lord, take me out. Of, I cried sometimes about the little trials I go through, you know. And, and I mean, it's nothing like what he was facing. He said, wherefore we labor. So, but that day's not here yet. So therefore we labor. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Why? Because I know, the Apostle Paul saying, I know that there's a work to be done. I know that earnest of the Spirit doesn't only tell me that I'm one day going to be with the Lord, but it also tells me that while I'm here, there is work to be done. He says that we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is different than the great white throne judgment. Old preacher that I used to sit under used to say, if you wake up and you see a great white throne, close your eyes and go back to sleep. <laughs> the great white throne judgment is whenever sinners will be judged because they refuse the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is where believers will have their works that they did for the Lord while they were in this body on this earth judged. Whether they were good or bad. We talked about that a little bit in the past that some people's works are like wood, hay, or stubble and they're going to be burned up. But their soul's still saved. Others would lay the foundation. Paul, you know, the, the Lord laid the foundation and the apostles began to build upon the foundation of the work of Calvary. Amen. There's no other foundation to lay. And now it's just about doing the work of the kingdom. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. The presence of God in us convinces us, amen, that he has better for us. And as this world begins to look less and less like our home and we hope more and more to be in his presence. But at the same time, we understand that there's work to be done. Amen. There's work to be done for the kingdom of God and he will continue to give us the energy and do the wrought iron, the, the rotting or the work that needs to be done on the inside of us that he can produce through us his will for this lost and dying world.